shapeshifters hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? everyone, and welcome to the Time Shifters Podcast. This is Christopher, and I'm here, as always, with Tom. Tom, how are you? I'm good. I'm good, yes. It's very busy here. <laughs> yeah, recovered from our exploits at the Comic Expo, I hope. Yes, uh, but that is, it does make for a whirlwind when you drive in on a Friday and drive back on a Sunday. <laughs> Yes, I, I know it is a bit of a drive for you to get out here, but I, I certainly do appreciate it. I would not have near as much fun oh, yeah. <laughs> if you weren't down there with me. That's ah, it's definitely worth it. So, but yeah, I, I could do with a teleporter, maybe that'd be <laughs> ma- fantastic. Uh, it was a good year. It was not too bad. No, no, no. I enjoyed it rather quite a bit. Uh, and um, as we discussed in. Uh, in some of our talks at the show, uh, I was impressed at how much conversation could be had despite the ongoing um, uh, strikes. Yes, no, I think the, the guests did a pretty good job weaving kind of, <laughs> it was like watching them go through an obstacle course sometimes, but they did a pretty good job kind of uh, weaving around a- any topics. And you know what? I didn't think of it, I didn't think to mention it while we were talking about it on the floor or anything but this kind of eliminated those those questions from fans that you often get at q a's that we've talked about in the past you know uh, what about in episode 27 of season (laughs) four uh you said that and like oh yeah those kind of questions none of them we didn't hear a single one like that i think we discussed that a little off mic uh but uh yeah we didn't get those but I, I can honestly say, having gone for a number of years now, uh, those are dying away. People are asking more thoughtful. Uh, you get you get the occasional oddity one, or or somebody that just isn't really sure what they want to ask. They just want to stand up there and and, and drool over their favorite people. But uh, yeah. see me, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like uh, we we were in one where the the guy had a well meaning uh, question to ask, but a very long winded lead up <laughs> to the question yes. of how do I get into the business? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I do remember that one. That was in the uh, the Clone Wars. Yep. Group Q and A, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. 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 The guy very. Very, like I said, very well-meaning, but he, he kind of stumbled along for a little while, giving lots of background that they weren't going to remember two seconds after he said it. So, Yes. Yeah, no, you're right. The A lot of the questions are becoming, uh, you're, you're not getting the quote-unquote fanboy questions. Uh, the, most people go up and asking them questions. It It's sometimes a little surprising. You you. These people come up there and ask these questions, and you're thinking, "Oh God, that's a good question. I wish I had thought of that." Oh yeah, I know, <laughs> and, and that's well. I'd like to say uh, the fact that, and you and I discussed this a little bit. We've been going to these things on and off since we were teenagers, um, starting with the early Star Trek conventions that would come to the immediate area, and. Those were hardcore fanboy kind of audiences where we both experienced somebody asking John Delancey to uh, demonstrate the power of the Q <laughs> right. openly into a microphone. And I'm like, and he handled it with grace to his credit. Um, yeah, no, he did really well. But it's been a long time. And as we discussed, too, like Star Trek was the convention to go to because there wasn't much of anything else if you had a comic book convention it was five guys sitting at tables uh, with a bunch of boxes of comics they couldn't sell any other way so that's early comic book uh, convention kind of stuff and we didn't go to a whole bunch of that but these uh, fandom things Star Trek in particular is where we started and that was also back in the day when it wasn't so cool 
to be into science fiction and fantasy and horror, at least not, like, openly. So, even though everybody watched the stuff. I mean, Star Wars and Star Trek didn't make bajillions of dollars off of nobody going. <laughs> so, so, but it opened the avenue to uh, maturing it, bringing in more people, building the love and... And eventually, when we get to some time like today, when nerds rule the world, um, and our stuff is just out there everywhere, the maturity level rises as you get more diverse groups with different thoughts and feelings about all of it. And it's just fun to see. It is so strange how much it's changed mm-hmm. in just the last decade, I'd, I'd say. Five, ten years ago... Oh, hey, Christopher, you know, what are you going to do this weekend? Oh, I'm going to go down to the Comic Expo. And it's like, oh, all right, <laughs> would be the response. <laughs> right. And, and now if you say something like that, oh, no, I'm going to go down to the Comic Expo. There's a bunch of, you know, blah, blah. And, oh, that sounds like that'd be really cool. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a good time. Oh, I, oh, God. And even think about it. Back in the days, late 80s, early 90s, if you showed up at one of these things in a costume, Mm-hmm. Oh my lord, you might as well have signed your life away. You are you are <laughs> you are you are the oddity of oddities and now cosplay is just like you're almost you almost feel a little out of place showing up not in a costume. Yeah, honestly, you, no, it's true. You better at least be wearing something. Something fan related cuz otherwise they're like are you with security? <laughs> <laughs> right. You're the hired help at that stage if you're not really flying your banner in some fashion. I think this was just at the expo. Was it with maybe Adam Savage talking about cosplay? Yes. Talking about yeah, no, how... Because he's um, a big cosplayer. Yeah, well, he was, he was talking about the uh, how open and friendly <laughs> just the cosplay world is. You come in a super elaborate, you spent four years assembling this costume. Wow, that's really cool. You come wearing off the rack, slapped together, your mom sewed it together costume. Wow, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, like I, I like how he was expressing it too, like put together with felt and boogers. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but but he's absolutely right. What now in this day and age, now he, I don't know how long he's been doing that. I don't know if he's crossed into prior because i mean he's been in the industry forever he makes the stuff that ends up on screen let alone a costume that somebody puts together at home so not sure where he was at in the 80s and 90s when when it was kind of like you do what again (laughs) it's not halloween guys yeah that would be a really great uh, i'd love to have a one-on-one conversation with him absolutely it's fun seeing him at the q a's and hearing everyone else's questions and how he answers them or whatever i would love to have an hour with him alone and just talk about that sort of thing i don't even need to go into mythbusters or go into tested or anything i was like let's talk about just fandoms let's talk about conventions let's talk about cosplay and and when you started and 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 the evolution and and your views on it oh god that would be so much so interesting and so much fun yeah because now that i they even brought that up i kind of wish i had gotten up to the mic and asked him talk to me about your cosplay prior to the uh, let's call it 2010 before you were you (laughs) the way the world knows you what did you do before that (laughs) Mm-hmm. I'd have been curious to get an answer to that, and I'm sorry I only thought of it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Isn't that always the it way ki- it goes? kind of is. So, uh, Adam, I, I know you're an avid listener. Feel free to get let us know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when we can expect you to get a little time with you. We'd love an answer to that question alone. I I think I will definitely. I've Tag him. Never, Tag him. I have not actively reached out to talk to him, but I really feel like... I I should. I think he could probably be into that as long as he's got some time. So yeah, uh, yeah. Seriously, let's tag him. <laughs> let's get <laughs> let's get him involved. And if you leave me out of that interview, I will be furious. <laughs> no, 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 no. This was definitely have to be a a two on one conversation. Absolutely. <laughs> All the Q and A's did go 
pretty well. Oh, yeah. I, it, I even mentioned it on the recording. The Brent Spiner one was just like slipshod. Hey, look, it's Brent Spiner and off he goes. And okay, whatever. That was the most kind of zany and off the wall q and A. I I think I've sat in in a while. G- given his personality, it works. <laughs> probably works probably for the best. Who knows what happened behind the scenes or sure. whatever, but the, the moderator for the Julie Benz and Rebecca Gayhart, uh, we mentioned off mic, he felt like somebody that knew absolutely nothing about them and was handed an index card <laughs> and said, here, go in, <laughs> do your best. Well, yeah, and he was handed an index card that somebody wrote um, three weeks before the strike. <laughs> Cause, Possibly. Because he looked like, I no. I, no, no, I can't. can't I can't answer. I can't ask can't, him any can't of these ask things. That, can't ask that. <laughs> yeah, he he, because there was that one point uh, where, and, and I I get it. We've all been stuck in an awkward situation where we're like, I have no idea what to do next. But yeah, he only had like two or three questions, and then he's like, uh, let's throw it to the audience. <laughs> yeah. Well, even before that, he was going on. It felt to me like so long, and I didn't even listen to the. I didn't add any of this portion uh, to the excerpts that I that I posted. I think, but I wondered if I if I can even be heard on on the recording, kind of whispering to myself, "Throw it to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Let the audience ask a question, because you're killing this." <laughs> I I was just amused. Like, I knew you were recording, and it's kind of funny. I've never fully put myself in your position as the one that's got the recording device. So you're sitting there fairly stoic, mostly because you're trying not to upset the recording, and I'm Mm -hmm. sitting there laughing my ass off to various things. I'm like, (laughs) maybe I need to tone it down a little (laughs) There was something I was listening. Uh, I, I did hear myself laughing a couple of times at one of the Q and A's we were at, and I don't recall which one it was. And that kind of surprised me that I was actually laughing as much as I was. Uh, if I had to guess, uh, it's probably going to be Adam because uh, you hadn't had much experience with Adam, I don't think. And um, well, this is my second Q and A that I've sat in. Okay, so. so uh, but yeah, he, he he's just generally likable all the way around. So I could sure, see him yeah. catching you off guard and going, saying something that gets okay. I I can't not. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. I do try to kind of if I'm holding it, if I have it on my lap or on my, in my bag next to me or whatever, I do try to like stay quiet because yeah. Even uh, when I got up to ask the question to uh, Julie and Rebecca. I could hear the chair creak as I got up and I'm like, Ugh. Uh, now, now audience, uh, I'd like to throw a kudos to my partner's uh, way because uh, actually him asking the question to Julie and Rebecca kind of ignited the, the conversation in a much better direction than it was going up to that point. <laughs> yeah. Because then the rest of the audience also filled in behind, so you kicked off a decent, a really good conversation, and then it kind of kept going from there as long as that guy stayed out of the way. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad I could help. Yes, no, you did a great job. There was still, again, this year there was just not that one booth. Yeah. This year. We we had some fun. We had fun at all the booths we stopped at. Oh, yeah. But there wasn't just that one that we came away from and went, that's awesome. Uh, You know, like three years ago, I guess it was, where we met, um, hold on, I'm blanking on his name, for uh, with the vampire foxes from space. Oh, yeah, him. Yeah, that was like two years ago, I think. But, uh, yeah, he, yeah, because we even reviewed his movie. Right, yeah, and then had him on the podcast and talked about it, and like you know, it was the gift that kept on giving. Yes, no, he was fantastic, but no, we didn't see anybody like uh, touting like their own little productions. I mean, yeah, there, we stopped in uh, a very good comic book uh, company trying to come up uh, with uh, some positivity built into it, uh, and boy, that guy was ready to sell. <laughs> Um, so he was fun to talk to, but he was definitely hustling. Um, yeah, Two Land Comics. 
for two land comics. Yeah, go back and listen to the recording. It's on there. Yeah, go back and listen to the comic expo coverage. And the folks from uh, Game of Ham were were amazing. Yeah, which didn't make the coverage because the <laughs> recorder didn't record. I think it was operator error, and I do apologize. <laughs> so uh, even though he's uh, recorded uh, some content since, we're gonna mention it here too because actually it was kind of he was. They were a lot of fun. The game's got a good concept. Um, so I'm looking forward to playing it. Yeah, just nothing that really just jumped out as being like, this is the best thing that we could have stumbled on um, this year. But, you know, some years are like that. I think it's probably more rare that we find that one booth than not. Well, let's look at it from a positive angle. It makes it that much more special when we do come across it. There you go. If, yeah, that's it. If it was every single time we went, that'd be amazing, but it's a lot to expect. So Right. And I'll admit that there's probably some booths I don't stop at that we could, only because they're maybe authors or they're other comic creators, and I just have that that vibe that they really want to sell you something. Yeah, no, and I I feel the exactly the same way. There are some that you walk by that um, while we could interview them, we're gonna get trapped, and then they're gonna also be put off if we don't spend dollars. Like mm, we'll yes, have wasted exactly. their time. Yeah, uh, I passed. There was one gentleman, and he's even like holding up signs. You know, let me tell you about my comics, and I'm thinking, well, I could go over there, but I just uh, I feel like I'm gonna be. I'm going to feel guilty that I'm not going to buy his comic. And it's not that I don't want to. It's just my funds are limited. Well, yeah. <laughs> I can't buy every book and comic and, and piece of art that I that I want to anymore. Yeah. It, it, if our audience hasn't gotten it by now, this is a hobby for us. We don't make money from it. Uh, if anything, we just need a little help occasionally just to keep it going. So, yes, it is definitely non-profit. So, <laughs> if, if not... Uh, deficit <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so that means we're not walking into these conventions flush with cash that we can <laughs> put down to everything but i don't know perhaps maybe we have an approach where we go we're hobbyists we put out this show we can get you some coverage but we're not going to buy your product would you be interested in talking about it for at least the promotional value <laughs> uh I feel a little bit like going to somebody and, and, and asking them for their art and then going, well, I can't pay you, but it's, you know, <laughs> but it's, a, it, 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 it's exposure. I, 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 I totally get it. But what do you think marketing companies do for a living? <laughs> <laughs> sure. So uh, we would be a lot less crass, but I don't know. I'm spitballing ideas right here open on the show. Maybe the listeners have suggestions on how to approach these things or not uh, but right but yeah no i get how you feel uh where it'd be nice to make a few more connections learn a little bit more about what's out there but without violating that line of here comes the cash right exactly yeah if there's any other podcasters that happen to listen that go and do these conventions uh how do they approach it sure. do they also feel a little pressured to you know buy a little something do they go to the booth anyway knowing they're not gonna buy a little something um i definitely have a pile of things that i have been sort of self guilt uh <laughs> bu- <laughs> guilted into buying uh when i've talked to people so and i've maybe i've read them you know, maybe not. Yeah. So I, I just, I've, I've been down the road in both directions. Yeah. As we're recording and I'm looking at stickers from one of the booths we visited at last year (laughs) with, with that same thought in mind. Yes, exactly. Ah, well, well, that's taken up most of my time, uh, prepping for the expo and, 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 getting everything ready afterwards and everything but that's that's i haven't done anything of note i'm still watching like my killer animal films i'm still on that kick <laughs> yes you are nothing really to mention to stand out you know follow on some of the socials because occasionally i'll post to uh, follow me on like letterbox that's a link i have not uh added to our to that link tree that's in the show notes and i probably should yes. that way you can you can see because 
All the other socials, if I post anything, I always post to the letterbox too when it's a movie review. So I'll, I'll start, I'll add that and you can uh, find me there because I don't remember what my username is off the top of my head. <laughs> that would be important. We will correct that at a later time. <laughs> Yes, maybe I'll add that to the show notes <laughs> there you as go. well as as well as add it to the link tree. So what about yourself? Have you been doing anything here real quick? Uh, I, I make time for uh, Star Trek Lower Decks. Um, that's still a very re- irreverent, lot of fun kind of thing to watch. Uh, so I I'm continue to be thoroughly amused by it. Um, I'm loving some of uh, where they're getting into some deeper dives into Star Trek stuff. Uh, There's an episode in particular where, um, oh, well, coincidentally, right first first episode of this season, uh, they make a little nod to their time on Strange New Worlds. (laughs) So (laughs) they talk about that Pike thing that they're not allowed to talk about. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Uh, So they mentioned that, but then it launches into an episode of, where they actually have to escort uh, Voyager, the the original Voyager, uh, to a destination, and then all sorts of crazy Voyager related kind of things ensue. So the entire crew starts going through their own version of a Tuvix episode. <laughs> so, gotcha. Yeah. So they take a very controversial thing and then take it to an absurd level which is just too much fun so having a lot of fun with that and related to our time at the uh comic expo ahsoka um keeping up with that i haven't watched this past week's episode but uh it's building i've gotten to a point where we're we're visiting with the actual real bad guy uh thrawn um who is actually and that's what I wanted to discuss about here. He is in the live action version played by the same guy that voiced him in the animated series. So the guy that did Rebel also is now doing the Ahsoka series. And it's part of where I still lament that we're not getting some of the other voice actors, particularly Ashley Eckstein. Um, she is not Ahsoka. Rosario Dawson is perfectly fine as Ahsoka, but as I've discussed with you before, they don't give the character a whole lot to say. (laughs) So she's kind of there for the presence and shows about her, but it's not really about her. So it makes it a little peculiar to watch. And I keep lamenting that it's not Ashley doing it because her voice one, she's voiced it from the beginning. Um, and I still still think she'd be fantastic in a live action version, but that's not the direction Disney chose. Nope, nope that ship has sailed, unfortunately. Unfortunately. But other than that, that's pretty much it. All right, well, then let's go ahead and take a break. We'll listen to a promo for another podcast, and when we return, we will take a look at 2013's Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters. comic book fans, I'm Joe Stuber, producer and host of Comic Book Central, where each and every week I welcome a legendary talent to the Comic Book Central lair to talk about bringing comic books to life. Greetings, true believers. This is Stan Lee. When do you think the Academy is going to wise up and create a special Oscar category for best cameo? I don't know. They're just asleep on their feet. Maybe your show, maybe this interview will be the turning point. Hi, this is Jamie Alexander, the Asgardian warrior Sif from Thor. I went to Marvel. They said, hey, sit down. We want to talk to you about this part. So what happened was I had a knife in my purse. I set the purse on the chair and it fell off and the knife fell out. And then they were like, oh, God, you really are Lady (laughs) Sif. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the one, the only, William Shatner. 
there's all these rumors out there that you're going to be in the next Star Trek film. Would I like to be in it? You know, I don't want to be a gratuitous character. <laughs> like scrubbing me, the uh, windows on the there. Enterprise or something? <laughs> there's a guy on the Chris wing. Pine. <laughs> there's a guy on the- <laughs> Chris Pine says there's a guy on the wing. <laughs> <laughs> Catch the very latest episodes at the website, comicbookcentral.net. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, like it on Facebook, follow it on Twitter, and be sure to join me each and every week for Comic Book Central. This is John Reese davis Hi, everyone. This is Summer Glau. Hi, this is Trisha Helfer, number six from Battlestar Galactica. Hey, this is Dean Kane, Superman from Lois and Clark, and you're listening to Comic Book Central. Where comic books come to life. Excelsior. Me and my sister, we have a past. We almost died at the hands of a witch. But that past made us stronger. We'd gotten a taste of blood. Witch blood. And we haven't stopped since. My name is Gretel. And this is my brother Hansel. I'm not going to have you telling me what to do. How do you best kill a witch? Cutting off her head tends to work. Hate that one. The last two weeks, we have five children taken from us. A witch does not come out in the open like that. I don't think we're hunting witches. There's something else going on here. We have to find those kids. Start with this. Shoot anything that moves. I see you got my invitation. I have my sister. Get off! Last new. Hell yeah! Come on, sunshine. Gotta be kidding me. Writer-director Tommy Wercola turned the Hansel and Gretel fairy tale on its ear in 2013's Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters. Abandoned in the woods by their father, Hansel and Gretel stumble upon a mysterious house made of candy hidden deep in the forest. Captured by the witch occupant, they are moments away from being dinner when they manage to turn the table and destroy the witch. Mysteriously immune to witches' spells and with an arsenal of incredible weapons, the two spend the next 20 years hunting down and destroying witches. When they are hired by the mayor of a small Bavarian town which has suffered a rash of children going missing, they uncover a plan of a grand witch to sacrifice the children at the coming blood moon. If successful, the witches will gain an immunity to their greatest weakness, fire. Hansel and Gretel set out to stop her and rescue the children. And on their journey, they begin to unravel secrets to their own past, which could shape their future. Film stars Jeremy Renner, Gemma Artington, and Famke Janssen. And this is the first English-language film and the first big studio production for writer-director Ricola. And up to this point, he was probably best known to, for 2009's Nazi zombie-themed independent horror film Dead Snow. I thought I saw that, but after reading the synopsis of it and seeing a couple of clips, no, I have not. But I think I will have to try to actually dig that up. That looked like a really fun sort of almost sci-fi original-esque uh, film that might be a, might be a little fun. Makes no sense, but uh, looked like it would be it was pretty well done for an indie horror film. Yeah. To be fair, though, you've just read the synopsis of this film, and I'm not entirely sure I saw the film that you did described. <laughs> <laughs> sounded far more interesting <laughs> <laughs> wow all right getting it started early <laughs> yeah 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 don't 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 bury the lead there tom Jeez. <laughs> 
No, interestingly enough, I, I find this movie fun, but it is problematic. <laughs> <laughs> I've caught this film a few times, and each time I'm just kind of walk away going, why is this film not as exciting as it should be? And that's a fantastic question, and I don't have an answer. Like, uh, Jeremy Renner looks like he's sleepwalking through the film. <laughs> and, and thank you. I think this time watching it, I finally hit on it, and I think it's the cast. There's no chemistry between Jer- Jeremy Renner and uh, uh, Jimmy Artington. There's more chemistry between Gemma and the animatronic troll Edward than there is with anybody else in this film. Everyone just acts like, I'm getting a paycheck. Well, and to be fair, while I was doing research for the reviews that we will review later, um, I actually read that uh, Femke Jansen entirely did this to just pay the mortgage on her house. I read that (laughs) somewhere as well, a little bit of trivia somewhere. Uh, It should also be duly noted that this was a January release and historically uh, movie production companies, any of the movies that get released in January are considered throwaways. They're just there to hopefully make some money till we get to a better season. Well, this one actually made quite a bit of money, especially for a January release. Uh, This is probably one of the most successful films on our list this year. Wow. I think the budget on this thing was only around 50 million. Yep. And it took in over 220. Yep. So I mean, it was a big hit. And, and well that and, was the worldwide hit, but I mean it even made its money back in US and Canada. Right. So for and, a January release, that's not bad at all. Right. And you know, there was talk of a of a a sequel and everyone supposedly was like all on board with it. Oh, really? And then after a delay or two, it, everyone kind of cooled on the idea and it just sort of petered out. Apparently they must've gone back and rewatched it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think even uh, writer director Ricola here, uh, had a script and everything. And then he went on and did a, another sequel for something. And then the idea of doing yet another sequel, he's like, I want to do something else and not just be the guy that makes sequels. I and get then that. when, so, so when he bowed out, everyone else kind of went, Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jeremy Renner is just not for me. Anyway, he is just not box office. He is not, he doesn't keep my attention. He's about as milk toast of an actor as you could find. Well, see, and, and it's interesting you say that because he was coming off of Oscar wins and his time, his his run out as an Avenger, because this all happened then. Right. No, I understand. But think about it, though. Out of the Avengers, he's like the most boring Avenger. <laughs> True, but that has more... I I think a lot of that has to do with which Avenger he is more than it does Jeremy Renner. But no, I... That's true. What what Jeremy Renner is for... uh, is known for is the strong, silent type kind of guy. Uh, Not a lot of of things to say, but he broods very well. He looks good doing it, and he's decent at action stuff. But... In the case of Hansel and Gretel, theoretically, he's supposed to kind of take the lead, and he is the narrator for for some of it. And it sounds as he's even doing the narration parts, he, it sounds like he could doze off at any moment while he's speaking. Yeah, he in this film is supposed to be the a um, little bit of the loose cannon. He's supposed to be the comedy. He's supposed to be the you know. Uh, jump in both feet and without looking (laughs) without looking exactly and yeah it just doesn't work if he was just the quiet brooding one in the corner yeah it might have been a little bit better he could have been just dark and brooding in the corner somewhere and had Gemma be the one that was really uh the one driving the story might have been of course then he'd just be Medieval Hawkeye. 
<laughs> Basically, uh, but I mean, that would have probably worked. But that's also where this movie kind of fails a little bit is Gemma should have been um, the analytical one, kind of the person in charge. That's kind of what I felt like they wanted her to be, but didn't didn't let her be that. Like, they didn't give her enough scene to, to do it with. Nope, I agree. Uh, I think even in the uh, in like a lot of the production notes and and and, and talks with the director and everything, they they mention how she's kind of the the planner and and the organizer of of the pair and everything. And yeah, they kind of get that impression across in the film. But you're right; they don't they don't give her enough. It's just oh, because she's the one that throws out the map and says, oh, we should go here, here, and here. Ah, oh, well, okay, she's the smart one. <laughs> right, but I mean, that's as much as you get. And, and honestly, Gemma has a presence. I, I would have totally bought her as, I'm the one in charge. My brother is just the muscle. <laughs> right. Yeah, but he sort of takes the lead whenever they go into town. It, it's him that's kind of taking the lead. He takes on what essentially is supposed to be like a carnival barker kind of role where he's going to talk him up and he's going to negotiate the deal and he's going to collect the money. But again, he does it with so little enthusiasm and so low energy. You're like, why do I li- why would I listen to you? Why would I, do- I believe you're g- capable of doing any of the things that you say you're going to do? <laughs> or the, the role of uh, Gretel could have been the you know the strong and the uh, very capable character in this film mm-hmm. and she's quickly turned into a damsel in distress a little too much yes yeah and i you know that's unfortunate i i actually would have liked to have seen the tables turned a little bit where she's the one that has to hatch the plan to save hansel um because i would have liked that kind of twist too oh they need the heart of a white witch and like well both these kids are the children of the powerful white witch. So wouldn't his heart work just as well as Gretel? Yeah. And I'm glad you already have us on this particular part of the conversation because they both hate witches tremendously. And when they learn essentially that their mother was a witch granted, and they're learning about white witches and all of that, um, that should have had a little more emotional impact than it did. They just kind of mm-hmm. glossed over it. And and while you're busy talking about the lack of uh, um, chemistry between Jeremy and Gemma in this, Jeremy also didn't have any chemistry with, uh, I, I'm not going to even try to say her name, the, the, the actress that... Mina. Yeah, Mina <laughs> is the character. But, I mean, Mina is totally into him. And couldn't care less <laughs> no no uh phila vitale as i'm gonna is how i'm gonna guess her name sure. is pronounced yeah no lots of vowels it's, it's it's lots of vowels and a couple of the same vowels in a row so i have no idea how you approach that right so, so my apologies <laughs> yeah. you're a fine actress i just don't know how to pronounce your name no and, and then i'll get into the problematic part with the introduction of Mina, I mean, she needed to be there from the perspective of they needed to learn what it meant to be a white witch so that when they do learn that their mother was one and the grand white witch at that, um, that that should mean even more to them and they should connect more with that. We didn't do any of that part, but Mina is with them all the way through to the end. And at the end of the movie, she disappeared she died did she she was killed I, yeah wow i totally missed that <laughs> uh muriel the 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 black the grand witch stabbed her and killed her at the at the house oh i didn't realize she had died <laughs> yeah <laughs> well they just kind of dim- <laughs> dismissed it as soon as it happened well it wasn't like you're gonna see jeremy renner uh you're not gonna see hansel too broken up about it because that's <laughs> that's what we said but that uh, and i guess that's why i eat and uh, trust me i had to rewatch the second half of it because i fell asleep the first time i tried to watch it um but as i'm watching that yeah it didn't even phase me that uh, she had died because nobody seemed to care <laughs> <laughs> like okay 
Yeah, there's just a little bit missing from um, from the script to just how people should be approaching. And they, I guess it doesn't even matter that Gretel goes through to the end of the film, and at least on screen, she never learns that there are good witches. She, I, We can assume that she assumes there were because apparently, you know, she's come to the realization that her mother was a witch. Yeah. And that she is apparently at least part witch yeah, or something. However that works. We never see any kind of discussion or kind of even inner turmoil at the thought from her. Right. And Hansel learns that, oh, okay, apparently there's good witches and I really like this one and now I'm sorry she's dead. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> uh, and he doesn't give a chance. If Gretel by that point has been captured. Right. It's kind of like we're, we're having, we're struggling to talk. Our oh, way. it wasn't at the house. I'm sorry, she didn't get killed at the house because she helped at at the at the big uh, rescue. She, but she, okay, so she was killed at the rescue. See, that's what what I'm saying is that's how little it meant. Like we we watched this only in the past couple of days. Right, <laughs> it's not resonating with us. How she <laughs> departed or where she departed the film, we just know it went with no fanfare and. The main characters don't seem to care. So, yeah. Again, I'll go back to I wish the tables were turned between Hansel and Gretel because yeah. it would have meant more, I think, for Gretel to learn about white witches, learning that her mother yeah. was one, and learning that it's been passed on to her, and then having her to have to actually work with a witch who she's lived her entire life hating, and have to work with them and learn about that there's good witches in the world and then them having the fight to save Hansel and then have him kind of have to come to terms with the idea of good witches after being saved by one. Uh, I, I'm sorry. That just seems to me like a better movie. Well, yeah, no, uh, and, and you're hitting on a bunch of stuff and this is a lot like uh, the last time with priest. There's lots of good, em- uh, lots of good stuff in here. There's, it has all the workings to be a pretty good and a lot of fun movie, but they didn't glue it all together quite right, and they missed some stuff. Um, the other part in this is because we're stumbling over that, too. Okay, we're presuming that they're part witch since uh, the black magic stuff doesn't seem to affect them, and their mother was, but that's just it. We never laid out what it does... How does one become a witch? Is it a thing of birth or is it a thing you learn? Apparently it's something to do with actually being born of one because Edward follows and and protects Gretel because trolls serve witches. And you see her actually pick up someone's wand and it glows. Even though she's never been trained as a witch, she's shown no abilities, uh, any magical abilities that we know of. So apparently it is something that's hereditary to some regard. Well, yeah, and I th- I get that that's what the movie was trying to get at. But again, we don't lay down terms for any of this. Right. Uh, and and you want to make a better movie since they had a lot of angst about their parents. Granted, their father abandoned them in the middle of the woods with them not knowing what's happening. And then all of a sudden their parents are gone and they can't they've been caught up at, at and I actually, that I want to give a little credit, at least to the premise. The notion that Hansel and Gretel got out of their own situation and because they won over the witch that tried to eat them, that set them on this path that we're going to save all kids everywhere from these witches that want to eat you. I love that. That's a lot of fun. No, no that's brilliant. No, I think it's a great idea. But, I mean, okay, so we also decide, well, we're going to introduce good witches, and we want Hansel and Gretel's mother to be the best of the good witches. And instead of the whole everything has to be hereditary kind of thing, how awesome would it be if after all of these years of angst over their parents, because they don't really understand what happened, that not only do they learn that the their mother was this grand white witch, but that she did something to by spell and by her death to keep them from harm from black magic. 
Well, we do learn that, and it's unfortunately it's through just the ah, uh, I'm the I'm the evil witch, and let me tell you what happened. Right. And she goes through and tells the story and tells about what happened, and then tells all. Oh, but your parent, your you know, your mom cast a spell of of protection against you, and like this really feels like. And what's really annoying. This isn't even a case of you can't even call it a case of tell don't show because they show it as they're telling it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and we turn her into mistress exposition, um, right? <laughs> but, but that see, and I'm saying that I have a, a better idea that apparently was part of the film, but because of the way they made the film, I don't even remember that that was part of the film. I yeah. watched it last night. <laughs> I can't remember that <laughs> at all. It was probably it was probably Famke Johnson's longest uh, you know set of lines in a row in this film. Yeah, and all I remember is them uh, rather disturbingly beating the crap out of her. <laughs> now I would have really liked it. Wouldn't it, again? I could just keep thinking of <laughs> ways that I think this would be a better film. Is what if you told us early on why they were left in the woods, but they still don't know? Let us see the events that led up to it, but make it so it's not obvious to them what's going on. They're seeing everything through the eyes of a child. Sure. They don't understand. They think mom is just telling them some story or, or, or just being loving. And suddenly dad is stealing them off in the woods and abandoning them. And then show us what happens and and let them... Let 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 us see them go through this grief, mm -hmm. and with us knowing why, and let them carry it and actually look like they're pissed about this, beyond just Hansel saying, "Oh, we don't talk about that." Yeah, we really. That's it. Yeah, of all the things you're not going to talk about in this film, since we do everything through exposition in this film, that's the one thing you're not going to have a conversation about. <laughs> Yeah, and let them sort of kind of come to the realization and the discovery of what happened on their own. And it would be really neat if they came to that discovery and realized that the very town that they are trying to save, that town is the townspeople that lynched their parents. Right. There are not parents, but perhaps grandparents of the kids that they are saving that killed and murdered their parents. Yeah. That did have some gravitas, but we, yeah. we didn't. And, and yet they still save the kids. Oh, yeah, because it's the right thing to do, and it's part of what they've grown up trying to do. It's also where, and not that I found the opening credit sequence charming in, in the way mm -hmm. that they were trying to handle uh, Hansel and Gretel growing up, that they're little news clippings from the various yes. towns. Uh, it, it was cute. But I think to get to where we're talking about, it might have been better to at least have acted out in some sort of montage, something where we see them growing up over a period of time, see them angry that they're doing this because it's more revenge for their parents who they also feel angry at. Uh, we needed to feel a little more emotionally connected to it, and we weren't ever going to get that in this film because they didn't want that. Yeah, now they this could have actually been a real interesting, and they could have darkened it up a little bit in tone. Yeah, and I, I maybe that's what it is. Is they, despite the fact that it's an R film, yeah, it's a really an R film because of the violence. Yes, and some and some brief nudity, which honestly you could have gotten away with in a PG thirteen, but it, it's pretty much R for the violence. But in tone, this is practically a children's film. Mm -hmm. This could have been a Disney film in tone. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and it kept trying to be a comedy of a sort without anywhere for you to actually laugh. Because <laughs> it wanted to be cute. It, it, it was uh, too clever by half, so to speak, because uh, it just it didn't pull off its jokes. No one seemed emotionally tied to doing this. And... and where they should have interjected emotion, they flat out chose not to. And the moments that the film decides to go dark, mm -hmm. it feels really out of place because the rest of the film is so light and fluffy. Right. 
like when suddenly Gretel's like attacked in the woods and it's it's a pretty brutal attack. Oh yeah. Yeah. And apparently it's even worse and there's a there's an extended cut uh that you can get on the, like the Blu-ray or something like that. It's even darker. Oh really? But that scene in the middle of this film where the rest of the film is is practically you know, uh, what was the film with the, was it just called the witches or whatever with the kids that get turned into mice and <laughs> Angelica like Houston and all that, you know, this could be in the same frippin' universe. Basically. Yeah. I mean, yeah, even the baddies were kind of laughable. I mean, right down to you get to the last scene where you're getting the whole, the witches gathering, um, and, and they're kind of a mockery uh, uh, of what they could yeah. be because, I mean, they're all di- different shapes, different sizes. They're all kind of gnarled and weird looking. and They look like something out of Jim Henson Creature Shop. Kind of, yeah. Only not as good. <laughs> 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 but yeah, like when you get the witch that moves, she, she, get, she has no legs. She's just getting around by her arms. Um, and then the conjoined twin witches and stuff. Yeah. Like, it's just like, okay, you're just, you're just trying to be goofy now. It's, uh, Terry Gilliam spent a week at Jim Henson. <laughs> <laughs> now that, yeah, that I can totally picture that now. <laughs> it's kind of where this went. Well, and then of, of course, Femke Jansen can't, can't be the ugly witch all the time, so they make oh, some, no. make up a reason for her to be pretty once in a while. <laughs> yes, no, absolutely. Again, it's a little bit more where the film goes light and comedic is the uh, is the character of Ben, who is the the Hansel and Gretel fanboy, and has the whole collection. And I mean, it's it's sort of almost a uh, Galaxy Quest fanboy <laughs> kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, the thing of it is, is with what I wanted this film to be, I felt like that had no business being in there at all. No, no, it really didn't. <laughs> and, and I know they wanted it to be comedic, but it kind of just came off sad. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and like you could have written the entire character out and I don't think not a thing would have been missing. I think you could have dumped the character of Ben and left the character of Jackson in the film longer. The, the tracker or hunter that uh, is assigned by the mayor. Yes. I, I liked him and I was really sorry that they killed him off as early as they did in this film. Well, yeah, I would have liked to have seen, seen him last a little longer, if not survive the film entirely. Yeah. uh, You would have liked to have found him to be like the sage elder statesman kind of person that helps them grow, helps them to experience that uh, maybe they don't have their own backstory quite right in their own head or, Mm -hmm. or could be even the person that sets them on the path that, Oh, by the way, you're in the town that murdered your parents. Yes, because he's definitely older, so he would have maybe been a child or or a middle aged or at he, least he may a, have a young actually adult. Been there. <laughs> yeah, he may have been a young adult at the time that that happened. Well, yeah, and and you could have developed an entire story where he is helping them out of some sense of duty to what had happened to their parents, um, and then even if you wanted to kill him off at some point you make him that sympathetic reason that they do the right thing no matter what Mm -hmm. there there were lots of opportunity there let him actually have a little bit of guilt towards the end of 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 what have it you know the realization of what happened and who who these people were that his village killed right and have him have some guilt that even if he didn't play an active role that he did nothing to stop it. Right. And then I'll just could put it out there. Have him have been the one to narrate the film. Yeah. Yeah. Especially from the perspective that we have just given, (laughs) it would have had a lot more impact and it wouldn't have sounded like Jeremy was handed a a piece of paper and said, here, read this into a microphone. So some of the things I think the film got right. Yes. One, right off the bat, 
the animatronic troll suit was fantastic. Oh, for Edward? Not CGI. Yeah. Yeah, Edward yeah. was fantastic. It looked good. I mean, it was, it was, I was going to say it, it looked real because it was real. Really smart move on that to actually have practical effect and not a, a big Shrek, you know, in the film. Well, yeah, and to their credit, uh, since it is a practical effect, they made him both equally terrifying and sympathetic all at the same yeah. time. They got the look down perfect. Yeah, they did a fantastic job on that. And what... It's such a shame that this comes right at the cusp where CGI really starts taking over because the idea of he's in a suit controlled by probably a dozen people mm -hmm. with remote control to do all the facials and everything. He, he is effectively acting in a mech suit. Yep. Oh, take that technology further. That should that should be what every uh, adventure and fantasy film and sci-fi film to come after did. And <laughs> this is like one of the last um, uh, examples of this sort of uh, makeup and effect. And I don't know if it's a, exactly the last. We'd have to do some research because I think you'd find there's probably some stuff where they have continued to incorporate that because CGI gets overused and it doesn't look like it's entirely there. I, I mean, even at its best, you can sometimes tell. <laughs> so practical effects should always be forever present. I just don't know how many actually take the time to do all of it. Well, and to that point, it was two different people that had to play Edward because there was one that did the voice and there was one that wore the suit. <laughs> That's true. The uh, the weapons of Hansel and Gretel. Yeah. I do think they they work. They're completely ridiculous, but it's the only way you, in this film anyway, it's the only way you can make it work. Yeah, I didn't find them to be the detractor, although the one uh, that they handed um, the Ben character at the end that uh, the rifle that's completely collapsible down to almost <laughs> the size of a small book. Uh, yeah, like, man, you better hope that's aligned. <laughs> 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 kind of, yeah. But I uh, like, okay, that one might be a bridge too far. I, 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 I'm giving you the Gatling gun. I'm giving you the, the, the repeater shotgun thing. I'm giving you the crossbow weird mechanism thing. But yeah, the 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 re the uh, self loading repeating crossbow yeah. <laughs> of uh, Gretel there was uh, pretty impressive. And, and very cool. And if you're going to go in this, um, we're going to take a, a Grimm's fairy tale and turn it on its head and and make these helpless children the heroes of their own story. And then you're going to add a steampunk quality to it. I got no problem with that. The, uh, those were not the arrows, the, the, the avenues to go down and die, die on that hill. <laughs> I wish they weren't always in the light. This film, I think we we've talked about other films being just so dark you couldn't see anything. Sure, this is actually a film where I feel like it's too bright, and maybe that's the uh, the they did it in three D, right? And maybe it's why it's it's so damn bright because if it was if they did it in, <laughs> if they if they did did it as dark as they probably should have, you wouldn't be able to see a damn thing. There, there, that's true. But then. That's also where that line comes with some of their weapons, because half, half the time uh, that cannon thing that uh, Jeremy Renner was walking around with looked like it was made out of plastic. Mm. <laughs> so when, when you have to make those kind of silly weapons, you, you can't let them stand up to the light of day too much. Yeah, so I, a, a darker tone, I think, would have benefited this this film. Yeah. And a, a story that would be more fitting of that darker tone. Yeah. There, I mean, the original story of Hansel and Gretel is actually a fairly terrifying oh, <laughs> fairy tale. Um, and the fact that it didn't achieve even the level of terror that that fairy tale is, is a little unsettling. It, it, this came off too goofy for that story. Given uh, Hansel effectively, diabetes yeah again it it 
doesn't play a part except to, at some point, oh, he's going to die and he's in the middle of a fight. And, oh, he, he lost his injection. And then he gets it and he's fine. <laughs> really? I, that's the whole reason you, you gave him this? This this trait was so you could just put him in a little bit more peril at about the hour mark of the film. If anything, I would have fa- found it a little insulting that they actually went ahead and put this in here. I mean, if you're actually diabetic, to to suggest that um, the, this child munching on the side of a candy coated house was enough to send him in. <laughs> into a into diabetes it's a little insulting to the people who actually have diabetes well yeah because that is not how you get diabetes right so yeah exactly it's it's magic induced diabetes from being stu- you know fed all this all these sweets to fatten them up yeah and then we don't know how long they were in the house that's another thing this film kind of falls flat on is were they imprisoned by the witch for a day a week i mean you she pulls them into the house and you see the next thing and you know eat this eat this and uh you do this but thinking how long have they been there right i i I feel like they've only been there for a few hours if that (laughs) it 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 put yeah you're absolutely right it played out too quick and, and then that part is also thoroughly unsatisfying because She's like rushing him to eat, but he's not gonna fatten up in thirty seconds. So. Right, and then her threatening Gretel when she wants to eat the children. <laughs> like it's kind of—I'd I- have been Hansel in there. I'm like, isn't that kind of an empty threat? <laughs> right. Yeah, you're just gonna eat us anyway. Right. right. So I'm like. I don't know how to feel about that, but even in that moment, yeah, it's just very weird. And then, yeah, we had to make him diabetic. We had to build out all of this just so that he could have uh, two seconds of peril near the end of the film. I I read that there was actually a thread in the original script that, as well as giving, I don't know if it was in addition to or in placement of Hansel and his diabetes, they were going to give Gretel an eating disorder. Oh really? <laughs> and they decided they decided to drop that. <laughs> you think? <laughs> <laughs> like I, how offensive do you need to be? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's all. At, at least this is all super weird and fictitious, uh, and the diabetes thing. If you're diabetic, I'm sure you're like, all right, that's lame. But <laughs> but you probably don't get offended to the level of somebody. You're going to make the girl have an eating disorder? Really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, yeah. Yeah. That, wow. I didn't even know that. That that makes me feel skeezy about this film even more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I threw the thing out to uh, the social media. I only got one response over on Twitter. Uh, Caitlin says that they absolutely love this movie. It knows exactly what it is and it goes for it. <laughs> well, that's fair, but just know that it could have gone even worse. <laughs> yeah. Or it honestly, it with a little bit of work, it could have gone a lot better, I think. Yeah, no, it really could have. And, and you know, we're having a fun uh, uh, busting on it, but here's the thing. It was still kind of fun to watch. This has got to be the third or fourth time I've watched right. it. You know, even though I don't walk away going, oh, that's awesome. I can't wait to watch it again. Right. Yeah. No, it's not that. <laughs> it is a watchable film. It is. Yeah. Because, and it, I think it fits really well in our theme that it, despite everything, it does look kind of pretty. Yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, it, it, it's a spectacle. That's what they set out yeah. to do. And, and that's unfortunately where everything else falls apart is they wanted to get to each of the next scenes that was a huge spectacle. They wanted to right. they wanted to pop the heads, they wanted to cut witches to ribbons, they wanted to set fire to things. That's what this movie was for. They had a little bit of dialogue in between to get to those points, and I think that's really all they set out to do. Yeah. Had had they made the film the way we wish they'd made the film, mm-hmm. we wouldn't be talking about it 
in this, at least not in this. Uh, no, we'd have watched anyway. it to just hopefully go, wow, what a concept. Think how awesome that was. I can't wait to watch it again, even though I just watched it two days ago and I probably caught it a month ago and a month before. Yeah, no, we'd be having that conversation. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I guess I'm a little torn because now that we've said that, as you put, it, it, it's a spectacle film, yeah. and that's what it was made for. And does it accomplish that? I, I guess, but it's just, it's not the kind of entertaining, it's just background fluff. Yeah, you could watch it a little bit, you could play on your phone, you could look up for a few scenes, you could go back to your phone. <laughs> Yeah, this is background fodder. This is, I don't care what's on TV, but I want to kind of like it enough that I go, ooh, that was cool, and then uh, go back to what I was really doing. What did the critics have to say on this one? Yeah, it wasn't as positive uh, as our friend on Twitter. <laughs> um, I'm just going to start off with the Metacritic. Uh, I'm loving the Metacritic, uh, like the the meta score, the the... the the number that they get off of the all of the reviews that they've tallied up, and it came in at a whopping twenty three out of a hundred. <laughs> wow! Now I I did know that it was, despite the big box office, it was critically panned. Oh yeah, no critics did not care for this at all. So here's the best of the bunch from the Boston Clo Globe. We have uh, Tom Russo, um, the director. Tears through Hansel and Gretel witch hunters with such giddy abandon, it ends up being splattery fanboy fun. Preposterous, clearly, but fun. So that's the best of it. <laughs> yes, okay. Going into the mid-range, we have Entertainment Weekly, Keith uh, Staskiswich. I'm going to butcher that name. Um, <laughs> and intermittently fun but overexcited and predictable mismatch that's okay. the middle of the road now we move into the darker territory new york post lou lumenic this is an exceedingly dull and stillborn attempt to update the brothers grim renner looks vaguely embarrassed throughout particularly when he's required to give himself an injection of 18th century insulin because of his childhood indulgence in a candy-covered house. When the Great Witch's trail leads them back to the same house for the mindlessly anticlimactic climax of Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters, Hansel quips, You've got to be effing kidding me. <laughs> My sentiments exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and despite the fact that as we said the film is watchable yeah so far i kind of most agree with that review let's see how you feel about this last one <laughs> okay <laughs> rolling stone peter travers what to say about this lame brain, limp dick attempt to update a classic Brothers Grimm tale into an F-bomb throwing, vomit inducing 3D franchise? I say, screw the damn thing and run the other way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that might be a step too that far That might for me. be. Gotta love his enthusiasm for his hatred, but... <laughs> oh, yeah. But yeah. No, that's probably a bridge too far. It was a, it's not like it's unwatchable. We have watched the unwatchable in <laughs> on a number of occasions. This is not that. It's just no, not no. particularly good. Yeah, it just hits right there and sits on that fence where it's like, well, it's not that it's a bad movie. It it's just not a good movie. Right. <laughs> I mean, it is it could not exist, and we wouldn't know any difference. <laughs> and, and it begs the question, is the good movie left on the cutting room floor? Like, this felt like it was trimmed as much as it possibly could so that it'd be less than an hour and a half, and so that they could send it to a theater. You could go out, watch this, and they can make a quick 20 bucks off of you. Um which is, I think, entirely what the point of this film was, was just, here, give me money. Uh, you'll yeah. like this. Watch this. Um, but 
I feel like because it has the elements, I don't mind any of the action sequences. They're fun. They look good and all that. But I wonder if there's some dialogue or something that got trimmed out. If there's some, if there is a little more emotional qual uh, quality to the film that got left out for time. I don't yeah, know. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, the only thing I read about the uh, the extended cut is that there's a little bit more action and, and violence. Well, I mean, they already had plenty of that, so to get more of it, I'm like, I'm sure it's fun and exciting and all that, but it won't build, it won't build a better movie. Right. I actually, I didn't even read one of the reviews where they basically thought that the guy put down the uh, screenplay on a cocktail napkin because there wasn't much to it. Mm. Well, yeah. No, I don't think this is a very thick treatment. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's kind of more of the pamphlet version of a screenplay. <laughs> yeah, I, I really feel like the the entire script was based on the elevator pitch. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, yeah, basically. Hey, we're just going to make Hansel and Gretel kill witches. Okay. Mm -hmm. Movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the the premise is far better than the actual execution of said premise in this case. I... I would be, I'd love to see someone take another stab at this idea. Kind of, yeah. But do it, make it a little bit more psychological, make it a little bit more darker. Oh, no. We've just set up a new universe. <laughs> the Grim Universe. Oh, there is. And I know they've done it. There's a, literally a Grim series where they're supposed to kind of uh, act on that. Well, there's actually, as soon as they, the studio, uh, Paramount even announced that they were going to do this film. All the other like smaller studios like Asylum and stuff yeah. through have their own versions. Though so there's like three or four Hansel and Gretel themed monster hunting movies out there. Um, actually, while I was looking for reviews, apparently there's a movie called Hansel and Gretel from like 2020 and it's supposed to be actually not bad. <laughs> Oh, interesting. Well, I'll have to go check that one out. Kinda, yeah. Here, uh, our review of this movie is go watch a different one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I think that is going to do it for Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunter. I think so. Uh, please shoot us your thoughts on the film. And after hearing what we've said, are we, you know, do you think we're way off base or on the mark on this one? Because I know there are fans of this film. Oh, yeah. I've, uh, there are people that plop down their hard-earned money and walked away and, and enjoyed themselves. So I'd love to hear, you know, how we've got it wrong. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. No, uh, we don't claim to be right. We just have our opinion in this moment. <laughs> exactly. All right. In two weeks on our regular episode, we will be back with 2017's Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. This is the uh, the very anticipated uh, return to sort of the uh, sci-fi fantasy of uh, the mind of uh, Luc Besson, who everyone was looking forward to after the incredibly popular and enjoyable Fifth Element. And coincidentally, this is the film that may have spawned this entire year's topic. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely one of them. Yep. But we will get into that in two weeks. So please uh, give us your thoughts on that. Send an email to timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com or follow the link in the show notes to any of the social media platforms and leave your comments there. We'll talk to you then, everybody. Bye. See ya.